I'm going to tell you a story from quite a while ago that is still very real for me and I feel has had a big impact on me and how I do psychotherapy. And it's about my first client. So I started in this field by getting a job at a residential treatment center in Vancouver. I was looking for a job, I was out of work, and they said they wanted counselors. I didn't even know what that meant, okay? But I applied, and I found out that this was a residential treatment center where kids would come from all over the province, and they would stay for about a year, and I was told that they would do group, individual, and um, family therapy. I said, okay. So I was introduced to Cottage One, right? And I would sit, I, for the first couple of weeks, I just sat there with my mouth open and watched this stuff called therapy, which looked pretty weird to me. And I had no idea what this was about. I had a degree in English literature, <laughs> a teaching year, and I taught for a year in a high school. So I was like, whatever, you know? <laughs> And the other thing that you need to know is it was Vancouver in the 70s. It was the human potential movement. So everybody was into something called gestalt, <laughs> two chair. I remember writing to my friend in England saying, North Americans are very strange. They talk to an empty chair. <laughs> and everyone was into something called catharsis and encounter groups. So it was like I was sort of thrown in the touchy-feely deep end without a life jacket, okay? So I'd been there for a few weeks and I was told I was gonna be given my special kid. And I was gonna be his chief therapist. I didn't even know what that meant. I didn't know what it looked like, right? So I was introduced to Lee. And I can't quite remember his last name, but I must have sounded something like Wimple because the minute he came into the cottage, Bruce the bulldozer, the big bully of the cottage who had shoulders as wide as this room and who terrified everybody, uh, and I'm including the staff here, he terrified everybody, Bruce the bulldozer looked at Lee and immediately started following around, him around saying, wimple, simple, pimple. <laughs> So we didn't know what to do about that. So this is the state of our therapeutic technique. We would ask Bruce very politely if he would mind stopping doing this. <laughs> but Lee was an interesting kid. Lee was about 14. He was tall and thin, and he wore a short-sleeved button-down cotton plaid shirts. He had enormous round eyes and his hair stood up on top of his head in corrugated waves. He looked like a young Kramer from Seinfeld. <laughs> the point about Lee, and this category isn't in the DSM, apart from what he looked like, Lee was just peculiar. Um, first of all, Lee had a, um, he had a phobia that if he swallowed his saliva, he would die. So he would walk around the cottage with his hair and his big eyes with his cheeks going. And then he would dash to the washroom to wash his mouth out, okay? The other thing about Lee is he didn't speak. Lee was silent. He was totally silent. What I knew about Lee, if you spoke to him, he'd look at you with his big eyes, and then he'd look down at the floor, and that would be that, okay? So what I knew about Lee was his mother had died when he was very young. He lived way out in the sticks with his much older father on a farm, and he'd somehow fallen through the cracks, and he hadn't really gone to school, and his father just wanted him to help with the cows. He didn't really have any peers, and somehow he'd come to the, attachment of the, to the attention of the agencies in town, and they'd sort of deposited him in this treatment center, right? So if you did, if in, in the group process we had every morning in the cottage, 
people would try to engage Lee, try to ask him questions, and he would just stare and look down at the floor. In family therapy, the sessions with his father were painful. I'd sit there with the social worker, and the father would drone on and on about his cows and how Lee wasn't very useful on the farm, and Lee would just stare at the floor. But even more difficult is I was told I was supposed to do individual therapy with him. <laughs> and I was told that in vogue at that time in Vancouver was something called catharsis. So I looked up catharsis in the dictionary <laughs> and it said that it was a form of diarrhea. So I thought, okay, okay, fine, okay, fine. What, what, I don't, what, what am I going to do with this kid? So I was supposed to have these sessions. So what I, I was so out of my death, it was ridiculous, okay? I was just sort of wandering along, right? So I kept expecting to be fired or something, right? So I noticed that in his room he had these books of birds. So I said to him, well, we're supposed to do this talking, you know, it's called individual therapy and we're supposed to do this talking and maybe you'd like to come in the garden because I noticed that you have books with birds. He didn't say anything, he just got up and he walked with me, so we would sit in the garden and I would start talking about the birds. I'd, oh, look at that rufous-sided toey. Right? Oh, look at that grackle. And Lee would just stare at the floor. Right? And it's a bit tricky because I was given a book on therapy and it said, you're not supposed to put words in the mouth of your client. <laughs> but give me a break. I mean, what was I supposed to do? Just sit there. So I thought, to hell with that. Right? So I would sit beside Lee and I would talk about the birds and I'd talk about the cottage. And then I started to talk about what it must be that I was going to guess, and would he mind if I guessed? And I'm trying to imagine what it must be like for him to be a kid in Cottage One. And I would watch his face, and I started to talk to him about that I couldn't imagine what it was like, that it must have been so lonely, and that it sounded like he'd grown up all by himself, and that he must have decided at some point that the world was a very dangerous place and that he really didn't feel safe with anyone. So then it made a lot of sense that he just decided to shut us all out and that maybe if I was him, I'd cloak myself in a wall of silence as well and maybe he didn't even want to come and talk to me. The sessions were very long. This is hard work, okay? And occasionally, occasionally, after about eight weeks or so, he would look at me and he would just do that. Right. And so I talked to him also about how when I was an adolescent, I got bullied because Lee, Bruce was still following him around, chanted. I got bullied because I had a working class accent. Right. And I got bullied and the way I dealt with it was I got angry and nasty and vicious. Right? And I actually thought that his way was probably better because he just kind of closed down and went into himself. And he would look at me and then he'd look at the floor. They were gifts actually when he looked at me <laughs> because at least there was sort of something happening. Right? So after a while, after weeks, I actually said to him, do you think it would be okay if when I see your cheeks filling up that I just came and touched you on the arm and said, Something like, Lee, it's okay, maybe you can try and swallow, and I'll be here, and if anything happens, I'll be here. I said it about three times, and the third time he looked at me and went, right? So then um, I felt like somehow we were connecting, but my supervisor said that he wasn't making any progress. And what was I doing? I didn't know what I was doing. You know, she hadn't even told me, right? How was I supposed to know? So I got a book by a man called Carl Rogers, you know, and that was sort of interesting. But anyway, so, you know, but I noticed certain things. Like I noticed 
that actually I did start to come up to him in the cottage and I'd touch him on the arm and say, maybe you can swallow, and he started to do it. Then he'd smile at me. And also what started to happen was when I went in for my shift, I started to find these pieces of paper with written out in print, beautiful print, with the natural histories of the birds that we were watching in the garden. And it was obviously from Lee. So I would just say, thank you, Lee, and he would go, right? So gradually, gradually, it was like we started to connect somehow, but it always felt very tenuous to me. And certainly the other people in the cottage just felt like he wasn't making any progress and it was hopeless. And I just sort of thought, oh, I don't know about this therapy business. You know, this, this, this is weird stuff. You know, I, I think I'll go back to England where there's normal people, you know, and like, like you know. So basically then something happened that sort of seemed to change everything. What happened was that Bruce the bulldozer got some money from his dad and went downtown in Vancouver and he bought a pair of bright, white, shiny, expensive cowboy boots. And he started walking around the cottage, prancing around in these cowboy boots and flexing his muscles. And of course, as he did this, he would use his favorite macho chant, simple wimple pimple, right? And he'd just march about and Lee would just sort of hide, right? So one day when we're having group process, group, we're all sitting around in group, there are 15 kids in a group and three counselors. So we're sitting there, Bruce isn't there. And suddenly Bruce comes and his face is thunder and he explodes into the group and he says, somebody's wrecked my boots. He says, somebody's destroyed my boots. I'm going to kill them. Right? So the minute he says this, there's an enormous silence that descends because we're all terrified of him. Okay? And everyone starts looking at the floor. And I look up, and Lee is opposite me. And I look up, and Lee's got a little tiny smile. <laughs> and so I raise my eyebrows, because by this time we're pretty good at nonverbal communication, right? So I raise my eyebrows, I go, and he, and he, this huge smile happens on his face. And I sort of do this, and the smile gets bigger. And then he stands up out of his chair and he starts to rotate his arms like he's about to take off. <laughs> and then he puts his hands in the air and he screams to the whole world and to us he says, I peed in his boots! I peed in his boots! There's a dead hush. It's like, uh, uh, uh. And then I, I start to laugh. I, because it was bloody funny, right? I mean, I just, I just start to laugh. And then suddenly, everybody starts to laugh. And the whole group starts to laugh. And there's Lee standing there like this. Right? And Bruce... He looks confused. This isn't what usually happens when he gets mad. But he looks confused, and he looks around, and he flees. Right? So it's really, this is really, really interesting. After this morning, Lee changes. He finds, he makes a friend in the group. He actually starts to talk slowly in stilted words, but he starts to talk. And in family therapy, he tells his father... I don't want to go back to the farm. I want, a foster fa I want to go to a foster family in the city. I want to go to school. He starts to come out into the world, right? And it's amazing to see him do this, yeah? So I'm realizing that something has really, really shifted in him. What has shifted? He's found his voice, and now he actually swallows, and he starts to talk in group, right? It took a while for me to find my voice. 
It took a while for me to figure out what I really learned from Lee. And no, I did not learn about the power of defiant urination. <laughs> he taught me something different. And he taught me something that I feel I have taken into every session that I've ever done with anybody. He taught me through his silence and through me having to go and find him where he was and stay with him, he taught me that therapy is a dance. And just like a dance, the essence of therapy is not the steps, the techniques, the fancy tricks, the moves. The essence of therapy is the connection between you and the client. The essence of therapy is attunement, attunement, attunement. Lee taught me that the essence of therapy is being able to go and meet someone where they are, feel into their pain, stay with them, stay with them in their starkness and their hurt, be willing to feel it with them and help them make sense of it. That's what he taught me. And that is something infinitely, infinitely valuable that really shaped me as a therapist. He taught me that. So when I think of him, I think of him, and I don't know what happened to him. He left the cottage. I lost touch with him. But when I think of him, I always think of him with soft thoughts, and I think of him wherever he is. God speed, Lee, and thank you so much for what you taught me. Thank you.